Hello and welcome back to episode 90 of Pride Rules MMA. Episode 90, we're 10 away, Omar. We're, I'm so excited. Oh, we're so close to the big one, Hundo. Yeah, we're going to have to get a legend to come on to the show for What do you mean? You're a legend. Episode 100. I was saying this before. I was saying this before. You're not fucking Yeah, up. yeah, but, you know, I'm, I'm a legend in the making. There's a difference. We need a legend. That's what we need. <laughs> so... Roberto, I know you're listening. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to coagulate here and uh, get a legend like a for episode one hundred. But right is that now, a, is that a heat? concentrate. Is that, a, yeah. is, is that a Jamaican? Is it a blood clot uh, yeah. <laughs> legend that we're here? <laughs> 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 right now okay, we're gonna sorry. concentrate on episode ninety. We have a great show lined up tonight. We got Jose Shorty Torres calling in to talk about his upcoming August fourth bout against Alex Perez. First of all, we just want to say hello and thank you to our sponsors, the ones who keep the lights on here at Pride Rules MMA. Uh, First off to ADK Fightwear, Black Hole Jiu-Jitsu, Madama Jiu-Jitsu, Two Minute Warning Sports 360, and our family over there at Fightbook MMA. I am your host, the Reverend Tommy D. We were supposed to be joined by Kareem the Dream early on, but uh, apparently he's just like anybody who's under 30 years old in the workforce and just does not show up. So, oh, bo- oh, wow. Me, Isn't he older? <laughs> it's my <laughs> homie, looks- El Professor Omar Sangarima. Yeah, he is older, but, you know, he's, he's acting like those kids that are under 30. Uh, yeah, Just sure. throwing that out there. You're How you doing, brother? How was your weekend? I'm so confused right now because he's the older, he's the younger. I'm doing great, though. How about you, my man? I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted, but I'm happy to be here. Monday night is my favorite night of the week. And uh, I'm excited to uh, talk to Shorty. Excited to see him get back in there for his second fight. Um, we will be calling him at about 9.30. We don't have him for a long show tonight, but we're, we're going to make it amazing for what we do have him for. So there was an event this past weekend. Uh, Artem Lobov with about 175 pounds fought Jesus against uh, Junior <laughs> Dos Santos. It went up from the last time you told me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. I mean, uh, what was it? Somebody posted a picture. He looked like uh, like Xerxes from uh, from uh, Meet oh, the sorry. Spartans. Oh no, no, <laughs> God, not even that's the slander. <laughs> this poor guy. He's you know he's trying to make a name for himself. I think he was Bulgarian, wasn't he? I don't you know? know. I mean, he, I know he was a champion over in World Series of Fighting, which became the PFL, but um, didn't look too good. Against Junior Dos Santos, but as you said, you know, Sagano didn't look too uh, too good himself there. But let's talk about the big news that everybody's talking about, which I don't understand why. Because it just seems like wolf tickets to me. Um, they're hinting that the fight with uh, Conor McGregor and Khabib will be happening, I think they said either October 6th or November 6th. What? What date have you been seeing, buddy? I've been seeing uh, October for some reason. Like when you first said it, I went and looked, and like I've seen, I've seen both, but I've seen October more. And either way, I I don't understand it, but you know, that's something I'd say for a end of the year card, but maybe they can't clear that in Russia. Who knows, man? I don't know. Yeah, no, it's not going to be Russia. It's going to be in Vegas, apparently. But I, should be in Russia. God damn it! But first of all. <laughs> Just be, uh, it's just weird to me. Somebody makes a video a week ago, and all of a sudden the fight is on. I haven't really heard either one of them say that the fight is on. Connor was sitting there at the World Cup eating hamburger helper, you know, watching one of the most boring sports that there is. I don't care what anybody says. How dare, no, stop it. I don't give a fuck. No, no, no. I don't care. No, the slander, I don't care. The world's game will not be will not be tolerated. Not even a small small amount. All Let right, me tell you, uh, have checking in it like hockey. Have full checking in it like hockey, and then talk to me, okay? When you got guys out there flopping like LeBron for a fucking to get somebody a yellow or a red card, get out of here. Put I, some pads I can't on and hit somebody. I don't know about that. But yeah. Put some pads on and hit somebody like a like a no. real fucking man. Anyway, no, no pads. <laughs> I'm, I'm angry. I agree with you there. Um, 
I agree with you there, but you know, sixty-five million dollars for uh, one of the top paid stars, and what's it? LeBron's only getting like thirty. Gotta be doing something right, bro. I'll flop for for money. Okay. Yeah, I guess because FIFA is the most you know straight and narrow organization there is out there. And, oh, it's a money laundering scheme for uh, international yeah. crime lords. That's I mean, that somehow I'm, Connor has his finger in that pie. Um, shocker, right? I'm sorry. He's going to yeah. end up being brick top from fucking Snatch. Like, he is. He's going to be some... It's not even that he's going to be like the Pikey. He's going to morph into the nefarious character who likes <laughs> tea. You know what I'm saying? And has dog fights and shit. Like, in a disgusting way. But whatever. So, you buddy, know? tell me. I mean, do you do you think this is Wolf Tickets? Honestly. I don't. I don't think it is Wolf Tickets. The only thing that... I think... The only... Parti- the only... It's the particulars that are wolf tickets. So I guess in a way you could say, yeah, the whole thing is because, you know, I think it's going to happen. I just don't think they're anywhere near announcing what they're, they are announcing, you know, and, and especially on, on a smaller scale with what they did with Ally Akinta and what they've just been known to do. You know, I always get the sense that the UFC, once it just gets tired of, dealing with people behind the scenes, they then just go and post something and kind of try to make it true. You know, you know what I mean? And then some people try to, you know, do that. They don't have enough wherewithal to say, Hey, listen, I think that's bullshit. You know, Al does and Al has another, another job and he can make money. So, you know, I think he, he, he's able to stand up to that sort of amazing, terrible peer pressure. But I think this is what the UFC does. Maybe they want to, you know, they're trying to, manifest it like the secret and just trying to say if I say it in the universe it, it'll come back to me but I think it'll happen this is a really logical fight and um but one of the things that I really don't quite understand unless they know something that we don't which is totally possible doesn't Connor have a court date this month like it, that's not a you know he might get a slap on the wrist but you still got to go to these things and and at least go through the motions and try not to look like a complete jack wagon in front of a judge. I don't care what yeah, size envelope he got. If, if anything, he'll be barred from competing in New York. Which is like, how is that a penalty? <laughs> I love my big state yeah. in New York. But holy shit, man. How is that? Yeah, they don't have, threaten me with a good time, judge. Favors. They haven't you done motherfucker us any favors. Me. Oh, Christ. I'm you know? Oh my they God. have not done us any favors. It's like, for, that's for like, it's like seeing like the judge is, is, is on Connor's side and is trying to protect his career. He's like, as your legal counsel. Wait a second. Yeah. That's, that's a conflict of interest. You can't be his legal counsel and the judge at the same time. <laughs> this is marring jurisprudence. What the fuck? Because it's not a bad thing. Fuck out of here. I, I wouldn't compete here. You know? I it's, mean, it's the, nuts, the, UFC, the UFC definitely needs it. And if they're looking to do this oh, in yeah. October, I guess they're going to look to do the Brock Lesnar DC thing in January. So uh, that could, you know, uh, I don't know, bro. These these money grabs are mm, they're iffy, just because they're going to promote the hell out of this because you know it's Connor and Khabib and it's you know what we've we've been waiting for. But the injury bug likes to strike at the worst possible time. Don't don't you agree? I mean, I would I could be a shithead and be like, when is a good time for the injury bug? But that's the only part that I would disagree with because the injury bug likes to. I mean, we were robbed of Ferguson and uh, and Khabib, you know, by some fucking weird chupacabra magic, bro. You know, Ferguson Ferguson slapped the gypsy or something. That that's the sort of injury that you get, you know. It's like he he took a light little slip and fall, and suddenly, you know, it looks like uh, Jason Voorhees uh, caught up to him, and he owed Jason money. So you know, it could very well happen. I just wish that we would have something in stone before we started generating this sort of craziness. Could be test marketing where they're trying to see where they get most of the traction on. Um, what I do, one of the, one of the parameters that tells me it's not really wolf thicker. So getting back to that real quick, word on the street is Connor spending his money like a madman. I know you've heard that too. So I think we're going to see him fight sooner rather than later. 
in a weird way. I I don't think this is a phrase that feels weird even coming out of my mouth. But you know what? There's quick ways to spend a hundred million dollars. I guess. Jesus, our grandkids would be fine. Like combined. All right, we could start a foundation yeah. for orphan children, and and we'd still be okay. You know what I mean? I should set something up on the Jersey Shore. I'd go down. There. Yeah, I I don't know, dude. Like, I find it hard for myself to get up for this fight just because of the fact that a you haven't heard anything from Connor, you haven't heard anything from Khabib, and you really haven't heard anything from Dana White. So, I I don't know. Do you think this is fans just generating buzz and trying to give this thing legs? Because I do, I don't see it happening. I don't, I don't see it happening. It needs to. I don't see it happening. Not this year. Not this year. But why? Like, what's your primary thing that says nah? It's been talked about so much. I just, I just don't see it happening. I see Tony coming back and fighting Khabib before Connor does. That's that's my honest opinion. I got you. So we'll see. We'll I, I don't know why. Something else just before. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I just don't know why. I I really don't. I just think it's it's too fan generated. Um, you know, Connor's out doing his own thing. Every oh, he's back in the gym and training serious. Is he really? Because last I saw, he was in fucking Russia. That's last I saw. He was in Russia. That's true. You know, but I don't know. I I just I'm with you in terms of like I hope it does happen. Sport needs it. Well, not the sport. I should say I need to stop conflating the two. UFC needs this. It really does. ESPN would love it. You, you know? know why I want it to happen? Because if Khabib does to him what I think Khabib is going to do, it's just going to shut his fans down and they'll just go away. And it will stop be this Connor Bless bullshit and Connor this, Connor that. And then, honestly, if Khabib just dusts him, I don't think we ever see him again in the UFC. I don't. It's a real possibility. He'll just, he'll just ride off the sunset. Or some random shit. Yeah. He'll just start his own. See, he, started, he started his own promotion. So with the money that he has left and the money that he'll get from that Khabib fight, plus the pay-per-view points and all that other shit, he'll just start his own promotion and... He'll be a success in Ireland. Good for you, man. Good for you. But, you know, I think the UFC needs to, to stop with the, you know, like Dana sitting by the phone waiting for a Connor phone call. I mean, I, I, don't know if he's been sit, I don't know if he's been sitting by the phone after what happened this past week between him and Brendan Chubb. I, I <laughs> saw that, and I know you were going to come up and, and say something with it. You know, and oh, I think speaking of which, I think our boy has joined the the fracas. Hold on a second. Is that Kareem the Dream? Of course. Oh, there he is. Here to here here to set Tommy straight on a couple of things. First of all, like, if like you're gonna what? openly, if you're gonna openly, <laughs> like, if you're gonna openly state the happenings or your your guess and what's happening, you got you got to look at both sides. Wait, He's got one way to win. Just one. One way to win. Every other, like, any any fight he had where he's, like, been tested out on the feet, he's been rocked a few times. But the dude's a monster. But you can't go, he's going to do this, he's going to do that, as if, however badly you hate him, Connor's a scrub. Because he's not. When you talk about that fight, you have to be willing to be honest enough to say, that yeah, did man. Scrub, did, if he did gets scrub, cracked, did I say scrub at all? Did I say scrub? N- at no, all? no, no, no. But you're the okay. way you're describing it with your like your hate for him is so bad that it seems like. Not saying it is. It just seems like for you, there is no way Connor wins that fight. Because I don't Which think is that there is. Absolutely... I think Khabib's, Khabib's shot is too fast. He'll be able to Listen, get in and put him on his Do back. you think, okay, let me ask you a question. Do you think that Michael Johnson stands a chance against Conor McGregor at all? No. He stood in the pocket with Khabib and he rocked him. 
didn't have the fucking wherewithal to follow up to try and finish, but they stood in the pocket, traded for two seconds, and the beat was rocked. Do you think... And still won the round. Okay, okay, but he would like... Do you think, like, given what you just said, like, who would you think is the harder puncher power shot, Johnson or Connor? Connor. Probably Connor. Easily. Okay, so Probably given Connor. that... Given that Connor probably has got the harder, harder power shot, better than Johnson, what do you think happens if Connor cracks someone? Like you have, I don't think you have to stand to... in the pocket with him. He's not going to stand in the pocket with him. He's going to look to put him right on his back, just like he did with Barboza. Did he look to stand with Barboza? Hell no. He, he put him against the fence he was, he and was, took him down. He was... Do you? Do you really believe there's no way you're so closed off? You're so closed off with how bad you hate him. You're going to say there's no way he wins this fight as if he's garbage. Like, you can okay. hate him. There's a but... fucking puncher's chance for anybody. But Khabib is the master at getting people it's... against the fence and putting them down. You're going to say, as good as Connor is, I, that I it's think I said only it. a puncher's chance. Well, yeah. Right. Like, is he I want to wrestle I'll... Khabib? We're not talking about out wrestling. I don't think he's going to out wrestle him for two seconds. I'm only open to possibility like if Khabib doesn't duck under and get him down right away, and he does that thing, he does where he's just like, "Oh, I'm gonna trade a couple of punches, then I'm gonna shoot." That's bad business for him, 100. percent Yeah, I don't. I think like he Connor, but I way. know if if Khabib ducks under, if he ducks under the jab and fucking gets in on that power double, it's a long night or a really short one for Connor. But you just don't seem to be open to the possibility that Habib gets his head knocked off. That's crazy. Well, it's a fight. Anything can happen. But do I think it'll happen? No. I it's, don't. It's not that you don't think it'll happen. It's he doesn't want it to happen. How you believe it'll go is like completely ignoring the fact that the dude you hate is a dope fighter. Like I don't like Michael Jordan. But he's a man. Like you can't, you can't take it away from somebody when you hate him. You can be like, "Yo, I hope this dude loses," or "I'm hoping it goes this way for that guy." But it just feels like you're raining on it a little bit. Well, yeah, because let's just say Khabib does to him what he did to Barboza. Is that really mm-hmm. an exciting fight? No. If he dr- honestly, if he dr- I don't. I don't- and honestly, I don't think Khabib, or I mean, uh, Connor stays in there as long as Barboza did. I don't think he I, will. If, if Khabib gets in there and, like, you know, starts dominating with the wrestling, I think it's going to be up to Khabib how long Connor stays in there. Like, he said he, said he made an example of Barboza. Like and that he breaks didn't my wanna... heart. <laughs> that yeah, breaks like, my heart. <laughs> like, uh, horribly so. Yeah, man, like, it was was crazy, but what I'm saying is, like, that kind of, he's skilled enough to speak like that. It's not like he's shit-talking outside of, you know, his range of capabilities. I just don't think with somebody that is known for just putting dudes out at that weight with that shot, a shot that Habib's taken more than a few times from several people, that he should play that game. And if it's in, if it's in his hand that he's even entertaining possibly going that way, then that opens up a huge avenue for Connor to put him out. Well, yeah, it's that it's that tall standing style that he has. I mean, I, the the dude's an enigma. For somebody that that fights the way he does, coming in kind of hands down, chin wide up in the fucking air. Uh, just like you're saying, you'd think somebody would tag him on that jaw. And yes, Michael Johnson did. But after he did that, he got put on his back and stayed there. Now, yes, Connor can drop him. There's a lot of things that can happen. But I would think that Khabib and, you know, all his training partners with DC and everybody would tell him, you can't go in there with your chin up because he's fast enough and powerful enough to catch you. You got to put him against the fence and you got to put him down. I don't think his takedown defense is going to be good enough to stop Khabib's shot. I mean, 
Barbosa stopped it a few times, but his relentlessness, you, you're just going there anyway. It's almost like just, just accept it. <laughs> it's going to happen. Just accept it. I'm just saying, like, before before, before it gets to that, that point, he's going to eat some shots. The only question for him, I'm not like, oh, my God, Connor's going to put him away because I Connor. I'm just waiting to see what happens when Habib gets hit. Like, the first time he catches him with a solid left, that is going to tell a story of the fight. If he wobbles him a little bit and can't finish him and it's like he just shakes it off, it's like game over. But if he cracks him and he stumbles him like Johnson did, even if he doesn't, like, rush him to finish him, it'll be like, all right, now now I know what to do for you. And he'll just, like, admittedly he will jog and stay away from him. And then any time he comes in, he's like, you know, it's going to be in his mind, like, wow, that shot, don't want to eat another one. What is he going to do? How is he going to adjust? Like, we've never, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's so many possibilities. We've never seen him be in any kind of trouble where he's worried about what's going to happen. Dude's always insane. And that's like one thing I like about him. No matter how bad, like, even when he was right before, he was never, never doubting in his mind for two seconds that he wasn't getting Johnson out of there. He didn't even like change the way, like, even after getting hit, Johnson doesn't go in on him, doesn't like get the, the, the down in the finish. He didn't change what he was doing in there. Kind of just like shook it off a little bit, got in there, and just went back to doing what he was doing in the first place. Can he do that against a dude that's a lot faster, a lot more accurate, and has a harder shot than that guy? Like, can he get hit and make no adjustment in the fight and think he's just going to, like, you know, go back into what was working for him and do it? And if he does adjust, what would it be to what? Because we've never seen him do it. The one thing I could see happening, because, I mean, Khabib is the one guy that can shoot from across the cage and still be able to get the takedown. I could see Connor maybe stepping back and throwing a hook and catching him that way. I mean, I I don't know. It's an intriguing fight. But honestly, I just want to see him get mauled so the fans <laughs> go away. This is I just the hater rate is fucking away. real. On this. Yeah, All right, check this out. Let me, let me ask you this then, Tommy. Let me ask you this. What happens if he goes in and he gets mauled and does the opposite of what you think he's going to do? What if, like, you know, he's down, he's out for a bit, and he goes, you know what, we just got to go back to the drawing board, and then he comes back? What do you say then? I think it would probably be one of the most exciting fights if he could come back, but I just I just don't see it. You're talking about a guy who wrestles with heavyweights and holds heavyweights down. <laughs> he holds Listen, I don't down. I don't I don't I don't buy the whole AKA thing with uh what? this guy holds me down like it's that's the same shit like we used to do over on the block, pumping people's head ups about dudes like, yo, this nigga's known to do this and do all of that and nobody's ever actually seen it outside of the circle of people making the claim, I've never seen a video of any of them full board going at it wrestling and him holding the, like, get the fuck out of here. Like, right now, hands down, DC is the baddest motherfucker on the planet, and you're going to believe that a dude who, like, is easily, what, 70 pounds lighter than him at the least holds him down wrestling in practice? Yes. Bullshit. 100%. Absolutely. Like the I, fix I don't, is in on that I don't, claim. I don't heavy. think DC. I don't think DC would ever. I I think there's a limit to DC's like, like nice guy, persona. And I think one of the things that he would be reticent to really, really give away is wrestling. I'm positive he could be like, yo, yeah, this guy's a better striker than me. Or he beats me up. Blah blah blah. I just he said it when Khabib's had a fight coming up. He said it when Khabib's not had a fight coming up. I mean, it's it's. Hard to believe, I'll give you that. But yeah. I think DC would just be like, he. I don't think he'd go as far as to say, yeah, this guy fucks me up. I'd say, pretty probably just go, hey, yeah, it's tough. He sees he's a tough guy. I yeah, don't know if he would talking have to about say like anything. he's holding down. I mean, think about how, like you said, how sensitive DC is over. Going back to him and Jones, 
the original insult he took from Jones was Jones like, laughing and saying, I bet I can yeah. take you down. Yeah, so and then that and guy then takes that... wrestling that series. Like, yeah, it does. That sparks some bullshit, but Khabib holds him down or holds down it. Come on. Well, let me ask you something. Practice with In Jiu Jitsu, in Jiu Jitsu, mm-hmm. if you have a guy who's 160 pounds going up against a guy who's 230 pounds with the right weight distribution and the guy's on top, doesn't the lighter guy have the ability to? hold the bigger, stronger guy down with technique? When you're talking about a 75-plus, no, no, I'm telling you, when you're talking about a 75-plus pound difference and both people are skilled, the lighter guy is not going to be in a position to where he has to hold the heavier guy down. Hey, Omar, what what was it that everybody, that all these bigger guys said about Hoist Gracie back in the day? For a guy who was 170 pounds, he was the heaviest guy I've ever had on my chest. It was Listen, your, your, your example is horrible because what you're doing is pointing out one guy who's a fucking master at jujitsu and the leverage and the grip game and all of that against a bunch of fucking morons who didn't even know what it was. They didn't even know what he was doing. You can't pluck out a dude that's 140, 150 pounds, and then put him up against a dude that's almost 100 pounds heavier than him and be like, hold him down. Because when technique fails, if you get a guy that's that much heavier and he's really good at jujitsu, even if the other guy's better, the strength plays a part. Huge. So, so Ray being able to hold down uh, James Hall is what? First of all, I just rolled with James Hall the other day. James Hall is 60 pounds heavier than he's ever been. This motherfucker's almost 300 pounds, and he's not fat. So that no, he's not. Is, but I've seen Ray. Is, I've seen Ray hold him down. And that was when James was again Ray. easier, 60 or 70 pounds lighter than he is now. And James is better at like Ray left and came back. The James Hall that was there before he was going, before Ray and Miriam came back, is not the same dude from back then that I was fucking back and forth in it with on fucking arm attacks, camors and fucking key locks and shit. That's what I'm saying. If you, and plus, James doesn't like using his weight. He doesn't like using his strength and size to do anything when he's rolling. He avidly avoids it. He was, what he did to me the other day is fucking ridiculous for a guy that's not trying to use his weight and strength. But again, when you get a really good guy that is that much heavier than a really, really good light guy, all the heavier guys got to do is decide that I'm just going to move you this way. And it happens. There's no way Habib's mm-hmm. holding them down in an actively competitive wrestling match. It's not happening. DC is the, like he's the best guy they have on that squad, and he's getting held down by no, no. Well, unless, Omar, at least, unless at least the beats walk around I know weight you're is on heavy. My side with this. At least I know you're on my side with this, Omar. But uh, I think it's time we give uh, we give our buddy uh, Shorty a call. Omar, you could do that off air while Kareem and I continue to go with uh, this conversation. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. I'll be yeah, back. Guys. Look. <laughs> I'm not saying anything is like, come on, you can't be, there's guys that have tried the fucking arm bar me and shit, like when they're on top and they're better than me from the bottom, and sometimes for shits and gigs, I just move them with the arm, like, no, you're not getting it, because that's what happens. When you have that kind of strength at your disposal and the other guy's that much lighter than you, it opens up a whole world of shit that is not technically jujitsu or wrestling but it prevents you from being held down when you really don't want to be. I don't know, dude. I mean, I, it, it's hard for me not to believe that Khabib could do that just because of his background. It, it's really it, – we have to see it. But as far as Khabib and, and Connor goes, I don't think Connor can hold a candle to his wrestling. <laughs> not at all. Not for two seconds. That's what I'm saying. Like, that that I know for a fact. That's what I'm saying. If Connor gets out there and goes and, like, paws at him, and the instant the jab is coming out, Khabib's already set in on that power. To, oh, man, he's going to run the train through him. That's 100%. I don't know, maybe, it, 
And just the look on Barboza's face during that fight, like when he was trying to get up and then got put back down. I've yeah. never seen – you didn't even see that look of defeat in his face against Kevin Lee because he was still Not able to crack him with that spinning with that spinning heel kick. Which was but, like a half an inch off from turning his fucking brain to like stand by. Oh, yeah, he did He did the James Brown shuffle when, when it got him yeah, on, he did. The, on the head. <laughs> Real hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's – it's it's intriguing, but I just I really don't think it's going to happen. I don't see it happening. I really Listen, don't. See I don't it happening. know. I don't know that we won't get the same kind of fight between the two of them that we saw the second round. I got him, I got him, guys. I got him. Let's bring him yeah, on because I'm let's, excited. Let's, yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, intro. we have back on the show our buddy Jose Shorty Torres who's getting ready for his second UFC fight at UFC 227 August 4th against Alex Perez. Shorty, brother, how you doing? I'm great, man. I can't complain. You know, another last-minute fight, but another uh, fun performance, hopefully. Dude, I know that, that your last fight wasn't the way that you wanted to come in. Were you training to fight for the 145-pound title in Titan FC at that time? Yeah, so it wasn't confirmed, but I, that's something I was trying to get lined up. And, you know, Jason Suarez just won the belt, and then I thought for me it makes sense. I'm like, man, if the UFC is not calling me, no other promotion is interested in me. Let me do something that, you know, just irrefusable to these promotions. Let me be a three weight class champion. Lomachenko did it in boxing. I know it's different weight class for MMA, but screw it. If I lose, I lose. And at least I'm trying to do something different for my legacy. And, uh, you know, it, it was crazy because I just got the fight denied, but at the same time, because it wasn't affirmed, I was help, helping four women get ready for their fight. So when I finally got this call from the UFC to fight a smaller, faster, stronger opponent, I was like, uh, I mean, I'm not ready to fight, but if this is my only way in, then let's let's do it. And, you know, I, t- I took, the, took the chance, and everything played out as, as you know, technically as planned. So how much weight did you have to lose? Uh, before your last fight? I lost 26 pounds in nine days. Well, you know what? That's because you got nutrition on your side, man. We love it. It is 100%. It is 100% the only reason. And he's actually – so the funny thing is, and a lot of people don't know this, I said no to McManus when he first called. He called, you know, the, you know, like 10-day notice out, and he called at night. I was like 9 p.m. Uh, he's like, or, uh, you know, my manager calls me being the messenger going, hey, do you want to fight? And I'm just chuckling. I'm just like, dude, no, this is a horrible idea. I'm not going to do it. I hate these last-minute fights. I'm not going to take them. <laughs> and mainly, mainly because of my weight because I'm getting ready for 145. But then I'm starting to realize this is like the ninth time the UFC called, whether I was injured or just sad or not, you know, in shape or whatever the case may be, or fighters, fighters denying fights. It's more of they don't care what I'm doing. It's more of, are you going to accept the fight or not? And there's only so many calls of these that are going to happen. So I go, man, I, I really can't just test it. I might as well just say yes and see where it goes. And I talked to Lou first, and Lou's like, you can make the weight. You're just sad. <laughs> like, you were bumping up for something different. And I go, oh, uh, if you believe I can do it, then let's do it. And he's the only reason I, I accepted the fight. Yeah, Lou, Lou is a genius. I actually had the, the pleasure of uh, interviewing him on uh, – on Jensi's show, finding out he uh, he lives in Jersey where I grew up, so it's it's pretty cool. We we love to have him here, and we knew if anybody was going to get you down to that weight, he definitely did it. But not that he got you down that much weight in nine days. You weren't drawn out. You were energetic. I mean, you looked like you look normally. How did you do it? Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm I'm really surprised myself because you know I've had my my traumatizing weight cuts in college and, and last minute weight cuts, but this was by far the the worst I've ever had it when it came to just trying to stay strong and just as much weight as I did in the nine days. So doing a fight week, I mean, honestly, they were giving me free Reebok stuff or they were doing the camera and the photo shoot and everyone in the background's like, how excited are you to finally be in the UFC? And I was like, I just want to go back to bed. <laughs> I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm pissy. I'm just trying to stay as calm as possible. My my coach, Master Bob Shermer, is like the the butterfly you just don't want in the room. Like, it's awesome to have in the room, just not this week, you know, because it's just annoying you. So I'm like, oh, man, stop touching me in the face. Stop making jokes, please. I just don't want to deal with this. So, um, you know, Lou, Lou's big thing was, you know, try to stay strong mentally. We can make the weight. 
you know, the, the science and everything that I'm putting into it, the numbers, I believe 100% we can make the weight. It's just you mentally. And that's honestly, that's how all these fighters, you know, they break. They break mentally, even though their body can't do it. They're drinking a gallon, but they only need five pounds of food, and they can't lose the five pounds for some reason, even though technically you have eight pounds of water. And it's 100% mental. And, uh, you know, at times, him and I both even wanted to quit. You know, I'm in pain. He doesn't want to see me in pain because we're good friends, not just, you know, partners in, in this, you know, team shorter business uh, thing we're doing. But overall, man, it's 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 a huge, huge thing that uh, I have by my side. And if it wasn't for him, again, I wouldn't have fought in UFC and I wouldn't have won my fight. Well, I, I got to say this. And, you know, Omar and I talked about this after your fight. Answered the one question I've always had ever since I started watching this sport. What happens – if one of these guys gets picked up for a suplex and starts to slither his way down the back, thank you for answering that question for me because that was amazing. Well, you're welcome. I mean, honestly, and this is something I'm I'm really baffled that a lot of people don't know. I mean, I kind of get it, but like me, you know, I follow Flow Wrestling, Track Wrestling, all these wrestling channels on Facebook to where you see scrambles all the time. I wasn't collegiate All-American. I did wrestle in college. I did wrestle in high school and all that stuff. So, you know, I, I've had nine years of wrestling experience against some of the best in the world. So, you know, for me, wrestling, when I got in that position, it's like, okay, do I want to be like the Brazilian he just beat where I'm perpendicular in the air and I'm just going to get slammed like Frank Trigg did against Matt Hughes? Or am I going to try to climb down and create a scramble and fall on? Because of the scramble, I was able to lock his hips. I was able to press my back against his chest so he couldn't arch. And when he forced himself, it extended my legs. My, my legs pretty much brought that momentum down on top of his head. It dazed him, given that wasn't the intention. I was hoping to get a scramble. But, again, I'm not going to deny a perfect opportunity, and I finished the job from that. Yeah, you sure did, man. Was he faster than you had anticipated that he would be? It wasn't that he was faster than I anticipated he'd be because all the flyweights are very fast. I mean, I'm sparring with Kyoji Horiguchi, and I believe he's easily the fastest flyweight I've ever, ever sparred with. But honestly, and this is not to belittle the women, but I was sparring with four women, and then I was also sparring with featherweight to lightweight men. You know, so the speed difference is, is ridiculous. You know, with the men, I'm literally bobbing and weaving like I'm Mayweather. And I'm like, yeah, this is freaking awesome. My hands are down. I'm enjoying myself. And then with the women, the power, the speed, the technique is there. But, you know, it's just, it's just you know, downed a little bit. So by the time I got to fight Jared Brooks, I never had any practice to to get used to, you know, fighting somebody with that type of speed again. So when I got in there, it wasn't really his speed. It was just more that his pressure, him actually wanting to stand up and him actually wanting to throw some punches instead of being the wrestler that he usually is. And, uh Man, honestly, I really wasn't mentally there. I had nine days to, again, people don't know the background stuff. I had nine days to not just lose 26 pounds, which obviously sucks all by itself, but I had the medical test to do, which some medical tests, EKG, MRI, blood work, um, um, eye exam, sports physical, sometimes take months in advance even schedule, and I had to do that in nine days. Um, do all those plus the medical tests, plus the um, stuff for USADA, UFC paperwork, all the flights in and out, and then trying to make myself try to you know work out and do all the social media and media stuff. So the promotion. I never yeah. had time. Yeah, I never had time mentally to to get in there. So when I got in there, it wasn't even that the lights were scaring me. I turned around. I was like, dude, these lights are hot. <laughs> I can feel the heat from the light. It's 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 crazy. I just oh man, I'm I'm about to fight. I completely forgot that this was part of the job. I was so worried about cutting weight that I completely forgot that I was fighting. So, um, you know, second round, I was starting to get back to it and starting to get a little more technique because, you know, I wasn't really there the first round. That that drop pretty much woke me up, and, you know, my coaches didn't even care about it. They looked at me in between the round. They're like, hey, man, are you, uh, you going to start fighting or what? And that's what Lou said before he walked back to the corner. He's like, are you going to start fighting? <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you know, so um, – you know, it's 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 a learning process, but I'm glad that this time I technically have about three weeks to to make the weight. Oh, he's excited about three weeks, Omar. That's what I want to know. Yeah. Like, when when is the UFC going to give you like a full camp, man? That's what I'm a little. It's, it's, going it's on. not a it's not a disrespect thing because I I do take it as a compliment because you know there's one thing that that's different for me in the flyweight division is that they know that I can make the weight last minute. You know, 26 pounds in nine days compared to the Darren Tills, Mackenzie Derns, even, you know, sadly, you over Romero having months in advance to make this weight, and they just don't make it. You know, so for me having these last-minute fights, this wasn't a fight that, oh, some flyweight fight just, you know, um, um, 
you know, dropped out and they're they're trying to make, you know, a replacement. They're just replacing a, and adding a whole new fight now. It's Perez and I both were already kind of decently low. We're like, all right, yeah, we, we both think we can make the way. Let's do it. So, you know, me, I the the thing was when I got the call, my manager was like, hey, stop what you're eating. I'm eating, like, chips and tuna. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I just, you, guys, you, you guys literally just told me I wasn't going to fight until maybe October, November because the, the flyweight division is a little backed up. So I went to enjoy myself, had a lot of salt yesterday, and then somehow – always i get this last minute call and uh he's like oh and i cut him off i go is it next week it's the week after i I'm, i need more than 10 days man this is i'm not doing this nine day cut again and they're like no 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 it's 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 like 23 days to make the way i go oh oh yeah i can i can do that i mean i don't want to but no yeah i could do that that's that's much easier <laughs> you, yeah, you, gotta, you gotta look at the upside of things <laughs> he sounds yeah. I, I, I think it's safe to say i i don't think you could get fat anymore with the way the yeah, UFC dude, wants to keep turning and burning you. <laughs> it's it's horrible, honestly. You know, this will be my second fight in two months. Literally, literally like maybe 60, 61, 62 days apart. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to need a little break. A good, a good month to just enjoy myself, enjoy life in general. And I, I'm not going to get fat. Instead of instead of looking at me and saying I'm fat, just say I'm happy. That's that's all I want to do is just get happy. And uh, and then after that, you know, get back to it. Maybe fight again, you know, November, December. But I'm hoping, really, really banking on the UFC, you know, respecting what I'm doing for them in this and just go, hey, we'll give you a two-month training camp. You've helped us twice, you know, last-minute events. We're more than happy to help you for this next one. Uh, yeah, I mean – it had to feel good, though, not just to get the win, but it, just to look at them like, see, I told you I deserved to be here, you know, it with was, that bounce yeah, back from adversity garbage, you know. It, it was a 50-50, you know, just because of the way everything turned out, you know. It, it's Yeah, I was on ESPN, I was on SportsCenter, and honestly, it's the best-case scenario because my name is literally plastered everywhere, even over LeBron on finals week the day of because of just how awkward that slam was. But it's one of those things that – if you're not educated, which is honestly most of the MMA community, they look at it as I was getting beat up and I got lucky, you know. So I have something to really prove for this fight, but now against a tougher opponent, which technically the, the opponent's going to be tougher now in, you know, after every single fight, mainly if I keep on winning. So I'm definitely excited to prove myself. I'm just hoping eventually to get a full training camp, but I was training before this. I was getting ready. I was helping Kyoji Horiguchi get ready for his fight in Arisen. Um, so I'm, I'm just excited to see, you know, what Alex Perez has in store for me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just excited. It's funny because Eric Shelton trains down here and he lost to both Jared Brooks and uh, Alex Perez, uh, literally back to back. So I'm like, man, am I, am I supposed to be your Avenger? Like, how does this work? Am I literally supposed to fight all your fights? Come on, man. <laughs> Is that what the UFC, they're just trying to make you, make me follow your path. Okay. Let's, let's see how this You goes. got a candle. And it's your image on the candle. He's lighting it. He's like, come on, man. Help me out here. Hook me up. Get, yeah, yeah, pretty much. So. I'm, I'm sure. just, you know, it's, it's, it's cool to have him literally be a practice partner and go, this is what he's going to do. This is what he's going to bank on. This is something he's very good at. This is something he's bad at. So I have the literally the inside guy who, you know, who's, who's been against them. So I'm very happy about that. So are you still training down in Florida? Yeah. So, you know, I'm a person that 100% likes to take two weeks out. Uh, before the fight so this is my last full week of training my last hard week and then I'll be going up to Jersey to Bloomfield New Jersey to stay with uh, nutrition and just literally focus on my weight the week of or excuse me the week before and just let my body recover you know even though I'm not in training camp I do have my fair share of bumps and bruises and you know I'm a little sore I'm a little beat up and it was funny because I was going to take a break uh, like maybe a week break until I got this call I'm like oh I guess not I guess I'm back to it so yeah, you know, I'm excited to get this fight over and done with, enjoy myself, and you know, see what it all takes from there. Oh man, you're coming up to Bloomfield at the wrong time. You got to come up here when you're not, and so you can go eat at the Belmont Tavern and have uh, Stretch's chicken. He's got to take you there when you're not in camp. Yeah, we the best chicken you'll ever have. <laughs> I know after I know after Utica, we ended up coming back and just went around to all these places. The really cool thing was. I'm now a, officially a UFC fighter. So Lou is like my manager going on Instagram, hitting up all these places saying, hey, I'm going to bring a UFC fighter in. He loves to promote your place, you know, for trying out some of the food. And we'd end up getting, you know, all these meals for free, which are freaking awesome because we went to some really, really nice restaurants. And, uh, you know, we, we definitely took advantage of the opportunity. We had a lot of fun in, in Jersey. But, you know, sadly, every time I'm up there, it's always because I'm dieting. I can never enjoy myself. It's the worst. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, we, went to, we, 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 went, we went to Jersey Freeze. Jersey Freeze is awesome, too, and Stuff Burgers. Those are two of the notorious places that we, we went to. And even, I think it was Luigi's as well. That was also very good. Yeah, Jersey Jersey's not short on, on good food, but, you know, not all of it's healthy for you. Like, if you're ever in New Brunswick, hit up the grease trucks. If you've never oh. had a grease truck sandwich, you haven't lived. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I feel like after I have a grease truck sandwich, I might not live after that. But that's that's something that, that sounds amazing. It's basically there's there's like probably fifty or sixty sandwiches depending which truck that you go to, and they put like chicken cutlets, uh, mozzarella sticks, French fries, all of it inside a sandwich. Ooh. <laughs> Man, you're, just, you're just making me, you're just making me want to call this fight off and just go to go to Jersey in front of it. <laughs> like like I can just be like I missed weight. Why? I'm not gonna lie to you. I went to some of the grease trucks in Jersey and, and I, I I had this podcast to do and see what happened was. <laughs> yeah, they give you a it. pass. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's it. it. You know, get the towel. Get the DC towel. You'll be fine. Just balance. Dude, it, it, that towel does wonders, and I'm I'm still looking for it on eBay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, if you if you weren't with Lou and you missed weight, it would just be the running trend as to what's going on right now. But with Lou, you're not missing yeah. weight. You're actually yeah, with Lou, I know that you know, for sure. Crazy. If if it was if it was just a business thing with Lou, I, I wouldn't care. I'd, be, I'd miss weight and be like, oh, look at that, I'm just another fighter, so I'll be it. You know, uh, oh, with twenty percent of my paycheck of nothing, cool. Yeah, you can have it, sure, but. It's it's the fact that you know Lou and I are such great friends now, and we we have built a relationship over now going to be nine fights together. Uh, you know, it's 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 a huge thing, and that's something that when I took the fight every single day, my motivation for that fight was make weight because I'm not trying to let him down. Make weight because I'm not trying to let him down. And he's had so many people let him down between you know Johnny Hendricks and Pettis mentally breaking for for their fights. Again, they both made weight with Lou, and then for, how do you now miss weight having more time to to lose it, it's a hundred percent mental because you know guys get burnt out, and I I understand the feeling, but it's also being a professional, like Eddie Alvarez said, you can't blame anyone, you have to blame yourself, and that's that's a hundred percent what I was, was what I was going to do if I didn't miss weight. How did you find Lou? Ah, uh, you know what's crazy is that uh, just like all the podcasts that I've done, there was a uh, a PR guy named Brian Levick who you know sadly passed away, but Brian Levick and I. You know, he was a PR guy. I literally didn't, didn't, never denied any interview. Him and I put every interview together. I even skipped practices to do interviews because I knew how important they were, mainly, you know, becoming a, a professional fighter, having my pro debut. And I ended up doing, like, twice as, twice as many interviews as, as the main event for the Titan FC event uh, that was coming up that time. And that eventually got canceled. He goes, well, what are you looking for? Do, do, you're Mr. Yes Man. I want to help you out, too, because you're making me look good. I was like, um, well, if you know a nutritionist, that's that's something I'm really dying for because I'm having my pro debut at Bantamweight. But, I mean, I, I used to wrestle 125. I know I could do it, mainly if I have two, three months to do it. And we ended up getting connected. Lou and I had a conversation, and Lou played hard to get a little bit. I had to literally follow him around to Albuquerque when he was working with John Jones. I had to follow him around to Fort Worth when he was working with Johnny Hendricks, and then back to Albuquerque when he was working with BJ Penn, and finally ended up stopped being a side check. I ended up being his main check when I, when I won a title. So he finally jumped on the bandwagon and then I was going to defend it. I knocked the dude out. I finally invited him to one of my fights and you know, he's like, Oh, okay. I like this kid. This kid actually listens. And that was a time where people started to, to kind of turn on Lee because of, you know, the, the missed weigh-ins. And he called me literally saying like, Hey man, I, I really don't want to do this job anymore. A lot of fighters let me down. I'll still work with you. But I just don't want to do this. And after one of his fights, I believe it was with Johnny Hendricks, I flew to his house from Missouri. I was with my fiance at the time. I even cut my time with my fiance short. I go, I think he needs a friend. So I ended up flying from Missouri to New Jersey to stay at his house. But by the time he got home, I was already at his house, <laughs> like in in a creeper <laughs> status. Like, Hello, you know, like the creeper <laughs> creeper girlfriend on on you know whatever social media feed. And uh, I was like, hey man, how you doing? And dude, him and I vented for a while, and we ended up becoming very good friends. I knocked out a guy, and then we just we, we got along from there, man. It, it worked out really, really well. And he knows that you know I care for him. Whatever he says, I 100% believe, even though I don't want to do it. But uh, he knows I'll do it. That's a great story, man. That's awesome. And uh, Roberto from Fightbook said you need to uh, head back out to Albuquerque so he can make you his awesome tacos. <laughs> That's it's, it's funny because. 
I had so it always works this way that so many people from all the places I travel, I can be there for months. I mean, I was at Jackson Wing training for three sessions, so that was probably about almost six months there. And that whole time I was there, no one invited me over. And then coincidentally, once I leave, everyone's like, oh, come on, let me feed you. I got all this food. You were in Albuquerque, what? You know, it's just like, oh, yeah. thanks. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that. It's usually how it works. But I definitely yeah. have to – I was supposed to be in Albuquerque this weekend helping uh, uh, Bean Win get ready for a King to Cage fight, but just things didn't happen. And, and I also had this fight plan, so I was going to have to cancel on her anyways. But, you know, maybe, maybe next time I'll, I'll come to Albuquerque and enjoy some food. Well, hey, man, listen, we only have you for a few more minutes. So um, how's everything else going with the uh, with the Team Shorty stuff? I know you were, you know, raising money to, to send kids to uh, wrestling tournaments and things like that. So what's been going on with that? Actually, you just reminded me, and I forgot to do that today. I was supposed to make a post, and so somehow it just uh, slipped my mind. So what I wanted to do is because of this, this last minute fight announcement and I do get a lot more uh, you know, a lot more views because of it, just because I'm I'm you know, publicized a little more. I do want to help, you know, the kids in my gym. So they're traveling August fifth. I believe it's August fifth to Florida for the IKF, the International Kickboxing Federation. So Chicago, Illinois, all the way to Orlando, Florida and you know, some parents have more than one kid where they just they can't afford to take them all. So what I do is twenty percent of all the earnings out of TeamShorter.com, go to the kids in my gym so they can travel, train, compete, and honestly just stay out of the streets. You know, the last three kids I was able to sponsor, they were able to go from Chicago to Iowa to train at, you know, the Division One Iowa uh, University to do a wrestling camp. And they, they freaking enjoyed it. I didn't get to do that when I was in high school. I was too busy, and I my parents couldn't afford it. So, you know, it was an opportunity that they kind of lived, you know, for, uh, for me. So it was, it was definitely awesome, but that's what I do, and I'm actually going to have a sale. Uh, the promo code actually right now, and I should put it up tonight. Maybe it'll start tomorrow, is all the way up until the fight, August 4th. If you use code UFC, everything is 20% off. Awesome. Damn, look, look at you. Champ, champ, UFC fighter. I mean, you're, you're taking care of kids. I mean, damn, bro. <laughs> you, I'm, like, you are, I'm like the Brian yeah. Ortega, but just like dumbed down a lot. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! No, oh, shorty. Oh, there's like there's levels to that too. You know, just, there's there's a hundred percent levels, and I'm just I don't even think I'm at any of them. I'm still at like the pre stage of getting to the first level. You know, like the introduction, doing the tutorial still. Okay. So yeah, once okay. once I figure it out, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. But. You know, if I'm able to, you know, most of that money, again, 20% of the earnings go to the kids in my gym, plus I'm doing 20%. Honestly, I'm making enough money to give kids money to the gym and just make more clothing. So literally only maybe a dollar per shirt goes to me, you know, so it's it's not it's not like I'm making a killing out of this stuff. It's it's literally me just trying to help, and as long as I have money to live, I'm, I'm definitely happy. Team Shorty is for the children, just like the Wu-Tang. I'm, I'm like uh, Team Shorty for the children. We can, we will together. We are Team Shorty or Wu Tang, whatever you want to call that. it. There you go. It's fucking awesome. Well, man, uh, you keep fighting the way that you fight. You're gonna make enough money in the UFC. You could probably give away those shirts for like five dollars. You know what I mean? Dude, yeah. you, you know what's crazy is that I, I was looking at it. I was like, man, I wish I would have got a fight bonus for the last one, just because of how awkward it was. I thought it would been really cool to get a, uh, get a bonus for that, which so bad I didn't. But I was like, man, I can get a bonus in this next fight. But damn it, this card is so stacked. <laughs> like, damn, I wish I fought on a card that had no one in it, and it's just me. <laughs> that would be so much better. But, hey, you know, I'm just happy to, to get another fight. And just, you know, honestly, this is easily one of the biggest cards out of the year. And, you know, I used to train with Cup Swans, and I used to train with T.J. Dillashaw and help them get ready for their fight. So it's it's a really cool reunion. Also, three Titan FC uh, veterans are on there, two champions, myself and – and Brett Johns and also title contender Ricky Simone. So I mean honestly, it's it's the perfect card for me to go to. Well, man, we know you're gonna come out on top. It's gonna be a great fight, a great event. So, brother, you already know what this portion of the show is. You know, shout out your sponsors and everything like that before we let you go. Floor is yours, man. Honestly, you know, my my, my sponsors definitely know who they are. If if I did shout them out, 
all of them out. It take a definitely another half an hour. So I do apologize to all my sponsors. I do appreciate all the love and support. And that's why I do say we can, we will together. We are Team Shorty again. Remember, use promo code UFC for twenty percent off for twenty percent of all their earnings to go to the kids in my gym so they can travel, train, and compete. At, again, TeamShorty dot com, and it really does appreciate. I, I, I appreciate all the support. Again, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it weren't for everyone's help, or even the podcast and media, and social stuff. So, you know, I, I appreciate it all, and. Uh, Again, I don't just come up myself. I help, you know, bring people up with me. So help me, and I, we, we help the world together, man. Thank you. Thank you, Shorty. Hey, brother. Yeah, thank you for coming on, man. Best of luck. You know we're going to be rooting for you, and uh, maybe we'll have you back on after after your second win in the UFC. Yeah, for sure. Maybe I'll be, you know, you know, having a heart attack out of those, that grease truck. I mean, maybe, you never know. So I'm excited. <laughs> we'll see where it goes from there. If you're you. going to the grease trucks, you better let me know. I will be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. All right, man. Well, listen, you enjoy the rest of your night, and we can't wait to see you fight on August 4th, man. Oh, I appreciate it, man. Take care of yourself, guys. You too, man. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's so much fun having him on. It really is. I'm telling you, he's uh... – one thing that really got to me was – um. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the charity work he's doing, that's fucking above board and amazing. But like, you, you caught that where he was like, Hey, when I started getting media requests, I paid attention to him. I started doing it more than, you know, I would maybe dip out on a couple practices here and there to really, really pump the brand. That's, he gets it. I think. And, and, and any, any fight promotion, I'm glad the UFC picked him up, but any fight promotion, that what have we always been harping on in terms of what fighters need to do? They need to promote themselves. Yeah, promotion. They need to be in front of the 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 marketing machine. They need to be the jet fuel that pushes themselves forward, so that other bigger promotions go, "Hey, let's latch on. He's doing the heavy lifting. We'll 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 get him over the top." That's you know he's, he's he. I know he made the Ortega joke, but I mean, he he knows what he's doing, man. And I, I'm excited to see him succeed. And he has been, you know, I want to see him continue succeeding, you know? So, yeah. See, and what he said that bothered me was that, you know, people are saying that he got lucky. Like that's, Oh God, that's what pisses me off about these casual fans. No, man. That's what pisses me off. Yeah. If you're saying that, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Like that wasn't a, that was a calculated, I'm trying to, and you know what he, but he was a hundred percent honest with it. Which is, which is even better because he goes, listen, you know, I was trying to create a scramble. I bought myself a, basically a slam KO out of it, right? But if if you know what you're doing and you watch enough wrestling, he was spot on with that. Like, that's a one big way that people like, you know, it's 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 like, it's not, I was going to say funky, but it's not because that's a totally different word. But like, it's an esoteric way to create that scramble off of that, that really takes like a, a student of the game and he went for it. So it's not, he didn't get lucky. The slam was a, a cherry on top, but he was setting himself up to get into a better position and, and, and not take damage, which, you know, uncle Chael says this is the name of this game. So, you know, it's a better, it's a better man than me well, saying I mean, that that was the way to go. Up- he brought up the slam from uh, Matt Hughes, Frank Trigg, but you also remember the slam with Frankie Edgar against Gray Maynard, where Frankie was able to do that and then you get on top. But Shorty, like you said, he was setting himself up for a scramble. I mean, yeah, the knockout was kind of a bonus. You know, I mean, that's just one of those freak things that happened, but he was setting himself up to have better position if he did get put on his back. I 100% That's agree, and and just I mean, skill. what was it? Frank Shamrock versus Zenobia. If you don't think Zenobia would have liked to to scramble a little bit more, you know what I'm saying? Frank Shamrock sure uh, <laughs> sure put a, a shoulder to him. He was making sure that that he was getting into a better position. That's not luck, man. And and you want to talk to me about luck with the the hard work that he put in for that nine day cut where he lost eight million pounds? Fuck out of here. Come on, man. Yeah, and, and you know that, that's a shame to hear that you know Lou was ready to give up because of all these fighters that were giving up on him. You know that's, that's insane. Yeah, that's insane. That's like that's like Merlin the magician, you know, th- deciding he wants to give up because he can't find a motherfucker that pulls that sword out of that rock. You know what I'm saying? Man, it's like no man, you, you guys have so much, so much great things to go for. You know, but like, 
I don't know. It's just when it when you see, you know, like a like a sensei find a really really good, you know, student, and then you see them feed off of each other. The things they can accomplish together are pretty amazing, and I'm, I I it's, I almost feel like we're on the ground floor of seeing something like that happen. Like say if we were back in the day with, you know, like a, a GSP and a Farasa hobby, you know, we were doing the podcast then, you know, and 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 he was coming on, and it was like, oh man, you know, you got the 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 wild uh, executor and the wild mad scientist getting together in the lab, and then, you know, the fighter goes out and does the things and. And it, it, that level of trust, I think, is is what's missing in a lot of coach relationships. And we're starting to see the results. Shorty trusts Lou Trisha. He trusts Lou implicitly. You know, and I think Lou trusts that that, that Jose is gonna is gonna do what he says and 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 give it his all. They're, they're reaping the rewards, man. Yeah, and I think one of Lou's first fighters was actually Eddie Gordon. I think he picks he quality, man. Brought Lou on the scene. Yeah, well, hey, look, man, he, he takes motivated people. I'm sure at one point Johnny Hendricks was motivated, you know. <laughs> it, that, and, and I know all jokes aside, we, we like shooting the shit and, and talking, talking wild, wild game business, right? But I completely agree. And that's why I think where the vitriol comes from, at least for me, and probably for you as well, Tommy, like, it's because he used to be so nasty. Yes, there's the nebulous stuff around, you know, do you, do you, does he pass the sniff test? That's neither here nor there. But a lot of it was because, holy shit, he, 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 was, he went from being the man that I thought was the closest to beating, you know, an evolved form of GSP, to use a Dragon Ball Z term. But he went from that to, you know, Fucking punch me for five dollars. <laughs> like, come on, man. What happened? In high school, you was the man, homie. You know, that pisses me off. That makes me sad. I don't deal with my emotions well, Tommy. Yeah, time. no, me me either. Well, <laughs> well, let's talk about, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but to close the show, let's just talk about some funny shit talking about people who don't know how to handle their emotions too well. Oh, shit. That shit oh, no. between Dana White oh, no. and Brendan yeah. Schaub. I, look, dude, first of all, Brendan Schaub coming out there saying that he had an inside source, again, with his inside source, just like the mafia had the, the hit on uh, on Connor. After that, I never believed the word that came out of his mouth again, um, that Max Holloway had a mini stroke. That was one. And I was just like, what? Where the fuck did you get that from? And then the Eskimo brothers line with Dana White. Now, here's why I had a problem with that. Was it funny? Yeah, okay. It was funny. You bet you. You bet you. But we all know who it was being alluded to. And I think it's pretty fucked up to do something like that, considering the fact that it could have fucked up marriages. A stupid little statement like that. You know you what I mean? You think so? I think so. I think so. You know, you don't think Travis looked at her and was like, did you fuck Dana White too? Like, you don't think that popped You don't think head? he knew that, though? You got it. Come on. Personally, I don't think it ha- I don't think that happened. I think you think you think, you think he's just gaslighting a little bit. I he's think being so. a little, little wild and crazy trying to trying to get he's doing it for the I gram so. trying to get some likes. Look, dude. Yeah. Ronda didn't need Dana. Dana yeah. needed Ronda. Dana needed Ronda. You know, so maybe he was uh, maybe he was dining out a lot. You never know. It's, it's but, not um, like an Angela. That's why I think it was really Angela Maganya that Brandon shot. Let's was not. About. Can we just? Can we just not? Can we just no? Can we just keep that? <laughs> Can we just can we just gloss over that really quickly? I know she's one of mine, but it's like it's one that I want to trade away in the racial draft on the Chappelle show <laughs> for like some sort of Asian character that can you know help us out to get into colleges and stuff. So like I I don't know I I what what really got me was like I really the meme that captures it the best is the Will Ferrell meme from uh, Anchorman. Well, that escalated quickly. 
I really feel like this got sideways and there was absolutely no need for it, but I feel that it was a little bit on both sides, right? Like Dana, brother, I know you listen to us every Monday, so take some advice, please. All right, the professor is, 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 holding, is holding a class here. You don't need to be getting in the fucking muck on bullshit ticky-tack issues like this anymore. You shouldn't have been in the past, but you damn sure need to not be engaging in this. All right? Try to act like you're the CEO of a motherfucking company or you're, you're a, a big cheese at a motherfucking company. Like, it's a billion-dollar enterprise, all right? Any, any time Dick and Harry that, that you know, took one business course or, or anything, like dreams of being in that spot, right? Like, for the love of God, I remember when I had a friend way back in the day who even hinted at the fact that he was going to get a job with the UFC. I was like, oh, you're the dopest cat on the block. It was a big fat sack of lies, <laughs> but it was cool. Well, I thought he was legit going to do it. Like just a job in corporate or whatever. Um, so that being said though, I don't understand. Like I'm a fan of Shaw. I, I listen to the fighter and the kid all the time and, you know, went to see a show. I think, you know, I, I, he, he's funny to me. I know he's not your cup of tea, Tommy, but holy shit. Why? So style bender took offense at something that Shaw said, Right, because he thought that he was get that Shaw was shitting on him for being like uh, a guy that just jumps in with not little to no MMA experience. When in reality, he was talking about Gokan Saki. Stylebender takes it the wrong way. Shaw retracts it, and we should be going on our merry way. The fuck does Dana White have to get involved in this at this point? Like, there's no need for this. Honestly, because I think Dana's getting sick of Brendan Schaub. Like, Schaub, and, and honestly, like, all right, everybody's entitled to their Dana's opinion. But if Dana's getting sick of Brendan Schaub, Tommy, like, that Schaub's then doing something right, because at the end of the day, who's got more fucking zeros in their bank account? Like, Dana shouldn't give a fuck what Schaub has to say. Quite frankly, right, if he was doing big boss moves, as they say, you know what I mean? Like, like you don't have to... Jesus Christ, if I had $400 million or $500 million in my bank account, do you think I'd give an absolute fuck what any, almost anybody had to say? I'd be trying to talk to Jesus on the regular every day, and I think you understand what I mean by that. But aside from that, okay, like, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have any time for anybody, man. I'd be on a floating fucking island that I could, well, like, I think, that I could like, I move from place to place. Honestly, honestly. I think what it is is the fact that, like, Brendan Schaub's got so much to say, and he barely had a 500 record in the UFC. Oh, stop. Like, he talks so much shit about certain fighters, yet he really wasn't anything spectacular at all. But he's he's a personality, and he's an analyst a little bit now, you know? And it's like, I don't want to... I only find the I only find fault with that line of reasoning only because then I don't want to start opening up the gap and going well any commentator or any analyst who hasn't fought and who hasn't had a great record shouldn't talk shit at all because then like that incapacitates I want to say not as much as it used to be because they are bringing on a lot more fighters into the fold there with uh, on the commentating booth so you're right about that. But I think it, it, you know, I mean, there's a Luke Thomas then not, is not able to talk shit. Like Ariel Hawani is he not able to talk shit? Like, no, let him talk shit. I, I, I get that. But, like, I just, I don't get, like, this, this should have been so beneath Dana's radar. Like, what, what is he doing about bringing up pay-per-view numbers? Where's, you know, some new marketing scheme with, with with which to leverage the ESPN uh, merger. So wh- why are we not getting started on that? I know it's uh, uh, January 2019, but you damn better believe that they should be getting on that now, man. You, you get what I'm kind of saying? I know you, and, and take it away. Like, I know you hate Brandon Schaub. Not hate him, but maybe, like, I know he's not your cup it's of tea. It's not that I hate I him. It's just I'm, I'm I get getting that. tired of him now. I get, I get that. I get that. But, like, bro, like, I'd have a lot more stamina with $500 million. You know, my fuse would be super long because I'd be like, why the fuck do I care? Why the f- like, you know, well, cause I, I got think coming he, to America money. He struck, he struck a chord 
with the fact that the business is doing so well now that the Fertitta brothers aren't there to, to leash Dana. That was that was the the I believe like the definite first too far move because I saw and and it's one of those things where it's like you know we've both had this situation maybe not with our present present uh, scenarios here but like when you're going back and forth in a text message and then you see the wall of text come back and you're like oh boy this is gonna be really bad that's I feel like that's what happened because you saw the going back and forth and it was little jab blah 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 blah. And then Schaub got in his feelings. That I will definitely give you. It, I, I read the back and forth and the timing and this and that, and I was just like, what the fuck? Schaub, why? Schaub's got a, a Showtime show. He's got, like, I, well, I think I answered my own question. We know why. You're baiting, the, you're baiting the bear there. This only helps Brendan Schaub. Love him or hate him. This, this is a bad look for Dana. It helps Brendan because we're talking about him. Like he's, you know, that got him super play. Like his Showtime show, I don't know how well that's going. You know, he might have been, it might be a a bridge too far for his brand at this point, you know, but he's still doing shows. He's still doing the fighter and the kid. He's got his other podcasts. Like, so that generates heat for him. But, but man, Dana, even, even getting poked, like, don't get baited into this bullshit. Like, again, would you ever see Scott Coker pulling this, 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 this ridiculousness? Did you ever picture that, really? Well, no, because Scott Coker doesn't go like balls deep on on social media. Like Dana will rip into an idiotic fan, at, where it's it's kind of funny, but I don't think it's really a good look for the business. No, that I, there we agree. It's this is it's like I mean, and you know what's hilarious is like Scott Coker is the classier individual, although to me he always looks like. He's coming down off of like seventeen lines of cocaine. He's always sweating, and he's always looking like like a little bloated around the gills. And it's like, well, you had a wild thirty six hours, all right. Prime day is every other day for Scott Coker. It looks like, you know, when it comes to you know, importing from Colombia. But it, I know he doesn't. But he just he he always he just looks weird. But he's the classiest son of a bitch out of almost anybody in the game at this point. Isn't that wild? Like he, you know, he looks like a sweaty, like fucking televangelist preacher. And then he winds up and like, nobody's got a bad word to say about him. And neither do I really, you know, it's just maybe, you know, carry a handkerchief and, and pat the brow every now and again. But uh, how does, how does Scott Coker come like, no, not to drag the brand through the mud, not to, you know, lie down with dogs and get fleas all over the Bellator fucking image, man. There's just. At this point, you know, maybe with the Fertitas it makes sense, I guess. But, like, you know, you guys got big dick money now, man. Like, there's no need for any of this. That goes kind of for both, but definitely for Dana. You know, Shab, Shab's a cloud chaser. He's always going to be a cloud chaser because I think his his whole ecosystem is built on being that way. His oxygen is this sort of controversy. So, in a way... You know, it's the little disingenuous. Like, I could see a little bit more of, hey, this is why he did it. But what the, what, Dana's a, you know, like, do we have to go and, and find other, four, you know, $4.2 billion level companies, public and or private, and see if there's any, you know, I'm sure they're out there because CEOs tend to be a little jack wagony, but who else is doing this? You know, do you think Jeff Bezos is going to be talking shit on Twitter? Like, yeah, Roberto just said it. Roberto just said it best. Uh, Scott learned from his experience with Strikeforce. Exactly, and he's right. He's a hundred percent right. And and like, I have yet to hear. And and in in a business with and and we love the fighters, Tom. You and I are both we're, we're all about it. We're mega fans. That's why we do this. We love it. We know that fighters can be diva as bitches sometimes we all know this you know it's just it's a lot of personalities it's a lot of feelings very emotional it's just they run the gamut right you you you'd be surprised there's a lot of uh um you know in a weird way like they're fighters but they still need safe spaces for their hearts you know what i mean it's some weird stuff like wait a second why are you in your feelings with this point being even with a tempestuous mix of of labor that consists of all those wild-hearted fighters, right? I really have yet to hear anybody that has a crossword to say about Scott Coker. That is remarkable, Tommy. 
everybody's got some shit to say about their boss. Not you, because, you know, I've, I've not even off air, you know. Tommy, I'm telling you, wherever you work, you're a gem. They're lucky to have you, because you, you ain't talk shit about your bosses. Not even once, and I've tried to get you to do it, and never. But everybody's got shit to say about, about who employs them, or who signs their paychecks. Have you heard anything about Scott Coker? Like no. Negative? Yeah, that's no, insane. Not at all. It's either he's the prince among all princes of CEOs, or he has the gnarliest hit squad on deck. That people are like, I ain't got nothing to say about Scott Coker because I want to, you know, keep eating my Cheerios uh, under my own power. I don't want to have to sip it. So, you know, he gets it, man. And in in a large way, I think that's one of the fundamentals of how Strikeforce has been able to was able to keep pace and become a target for acquisition by the UFC, and why right now Bellator is, is making the moves that it's making. Don't you agree? Like he's doing well, something thing, right over there. Well, yeah. Well, the one thing that he's doing right is he doesn't buddy up to certain fighters like Dana does. Yeah. You know, Dana has always buddied up to, you know, Chuck Liddell. I know he was Chuck Liddell's manager. He always buddied up to him. You know, he basically fucking gives Connor hand jobs. Um, he just, yeah, he it's, like ties it's, himself. It's, it's, and I got to say, it's getting obscene right now. I agree. Yeah. I agree. He, like, he, yeah, he ties wow. himself to these certain fighters, like, especially with Brock Lesnar. Like, oh, there's Brock Lesnar and his wife walking to his seat with Dana White. Scott Coker doesn't do that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and and, Scott, and Scott by that way, that. by that way, the brand doesn't live or die, based off of a handful of stars' comings and goings. Like as bad as it would be in the short run, say for example, like if God forbid, you know, I don't know, Michael Venom Page was caught in a, a bank heist in Morocco. You know, he pulled a Lee Murray. You know. As bad as that would be, um, I don't think like it, Bellator would survive, and I think it would have a it would re, it would revert to the median level of success, right? It would right the ship much faster than what the UFC's even been trying to do with figuring out what John Jones is is, is going is going to be happening. What what John Jones is going to show up? What's happening with him? Do you get me? You know, it's 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 not as feast or famine because Coker is like, hey, I want to have a good relationship with everybody. They're all my employees. I don't want to come off, you know, looking like I favor people because that's just going to – and it breeds resentments. And it sets you up to look like a, a, a fucking bunch of chooches when, you know, they don't want to come and fight because they've made $100 million, you know? Yeah, and, and, you know, fight harder. Just, just and, uh-huh. and just like Roberto was just saying to me, you know, the, the sponsorship with Bellator is key. You know, Scott Coker said, you know, they'll make what we pay them, and if they make a million with sponsors, good for them. Kind of why I think Coker's a little bit more respected. You know, because Dana and the UFC are making a ton on sponsorship. You know, like I've said it a million times, the Octagon looks like a fucking NASCAR. And these guys yeah. are just sponsored yeah. by Reebok. That that's the only sponsors that they could show when they're walking out to the cage is Reebok. And that's kind of not fair because again, the UFC is getting the lion's share from Reebok, and these guys are getting crumbs. I've been I've been a part of companies on on both sides of this dichotomy where the company's done very 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 well, and. They've treated it, their employees correctly, and like the company success trickled down a little bit into you know the rank and file success, right? So, and I know that that created just a sense of camaraderie, a sense of ownership of that company, and you know, at least for me, maybe I was a herb, I guess, but like, okay, if if they're gonna throw me a couple extra dollars when we have a great quarter, then I'm gonna stay a little longer. I'm gonna do a little more. I'm gonna try a little bit, but. I've been part of companies that have been on the other end of that spectrum, a little more of the UFC's model where, you know, you hear and see the owners and you hear and see the company doing phenomenally well, right? 
driving great cars. Everybody's, you know, the top is getting bonuses, blah, blah, blah. And we hear crickets when it's time to, to get paid. That eventually, over time, unless something, some other external force is tipping the scales uh, in, in favor of that shit-ass company, like that over time erodes on that, that company's well-being. You know, that, that, that first more Bellator model where I feel as though, you know, the rising tide raises all ships in a sense, you're starting to see the difference there, man. You know, but I think it all stems back from, from, from the top, from the leadership. And, you know, to kind of circle it back around, I would never expect to see Scott Coker in anybody's mentions being a shithead or calling them like retarded or something. And and I only use that word, you know, I'm, I don't mean to offend, but I think that's, I probably, wasn't that one of the words they used? Like, I think Dana might have thrown that out there. Maybe I'm just superimposing because I'm still slightly bigoted. I'm sorry. Again, I apologize. But, like, I feel as though that's probably not the worst of anything that Dana White has said. And still, that's nowhere near what we would see Scott Coker even attempt. Well, because Skoker, Skoker, hello, Scott Coker makes it about the fighters. Dana White yep. makes it about himself. Mm-hmm. You know, Dana White's looking for a fight. Why can't it just be looking for a fight? Why does it have to be Dana White's looking for a fight? Dana White's Tuesday night contender. Why can't it just be the Tuesday night contender? Yeah, Why does it have yeah, to exactly, be yeah. Dana White? Yeah, there's no need for Why that. Why does it have to be him? You know, because he's he's building his own brand, bro, and he's you know, and he's he's bigger than the brand. Yeah, but that he's, brand has been yeah. built already for how many years? He's you know been the the president of the UFC. It's 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 there already. You know, Scott Coker. It's not called Scott Coker's Bellator. It's about the fighters over there. You know, or so, you know, it's it's about them. You know, and and you're going to see more of these UFC fighters fighting out the last of their contracts. If they're not getting any love, and they're going to jump on over to Bellator, like Rory McDonald did, <laughs> I think that was UFC. that's a bigger signing. And 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 as time goes on, we're going to see real, really, and truly like how big of a signing that was. Musashi followed him over there. You know, like if if you're not the super super tip top of the spear in terms of earning power or draw, and the UFC makes you feel it, right? And if the UFC is making you feel that way, but you you know they're undervaluing you a little bit, Bellator comes slides right into your DMs and says, "Baby, he, your man's not treating you right. Let me let me treat you better." And you know, and Coker's what? got enough of a of a of a reputation, right? That it, he, he's not selling snake oil. That's that's what adds to it. Anybody else could come out and say, Tommy, hey, listen, I'll pay you nine billion dollars if you come work for me, right? But if you if you trust the offer, you're gonna say, Oh yeah, okay. But if you if it's just some fucking, you know, Sven Gali coming out and being like, I got I got mad money, right? You're not gonna risk your family's well being on that bullshit. Coker's got the, the juice in that sense. Yeah, and you know, we can't sleep on the PSL either, you know. Um they're doing. They're, they're going for things. everybody's head. Holy shit! Mm-hmm. No. Jesus, they're like, oh, oh yeah, oh, oh, you want to treat your fighters well and 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 pay them well? Oh, we we got that, and we'll raise you a phenomenal format that I want everybody and their mother to adopt. For God's sake, I want that to be part of my performance review at my job. <laughs> I want I want there to be points for like better and earlier finishes of projects. Because holy crap, man, they they've done it. You know, I know the our sports has a really you know relatively like short history, but I'm telling you, and 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 I'm not trying to bag the PFL, but regardless of what happens with the PFL, that format is one of their biggest contributions to MMA. Period. I love it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, these guys are going for it. You're you're not going to sit there and see a lay and pray because it's not going to get you anywhere. It's just not. And that's kind of what the sport's all about. Like, you're not going to have every fight being a, 
knock down, drag out, rock 'em, sock 'em robot fight where, you know, there's no technique involved. But these guys are going for it, and that's what makes it exciting. I I, I wish there were, there was some more promotion behind it, you know, to get it out there a little bit more other than just the niche market that it has right now. Um, uh, but it needs to be successful. It does. And what would make it successful is, a, I'm not going to say a, a ton of bigger names, but even if it's just three or four bigger name fighters jumping over to the PFL for season two, that would really get it, get that ball rolling and, and get it, get it going for them. Don't you think? I think it's going to be that momentum would be undeniable if that would happen. Cause I think, I think they're going to get some promotion. What I think they're doing is like, they're, they're kind of letting it simmer, letting it build kind of organically. You know, it's, I don't think they're going to turn around and be like, well, you know, we didn't get enough viewers. So fuck you and your million dollars to the, to the fighters. I don't think that's going to happen at all. What I think is going to happen is as it gets closer to uh, the brackets being done, you know, and starting to see the, the playoff format there, which I don't know if you caught it, Tommy, but there's one event that they're going to have two fights in one night. They said that on one of the graphics, bro. Yeah. I didn't see that, but oh ooh. shit, yeah, oh shit. One, of, I think like the quarters and the and uh, the semis are going to be in one evening. And then, or, or, or like, it's going to be, you know, the first and second round of the playoffs are going to be in one evening, and then the subsequent rounds are going to be on individual evenings. I swear, I really, I need to look this up, and if somebody has, has a line on it, please come and let us know. But I saw that, and I wanted to bring that up to you. I almost jumped out of my, my fucking sofa. But, um, so I think as it progresses, I think they're going to maybe generate a little bit more, try to put a little more heat on it. Like, if you're handing out million-dollar checks, the optics of that, you want that plastered across every social media, every digital platform where it's like, holy shit, they're really handing million dollar checks because as a, as a young fighter, as an up and coming fighter, or maybe as a fighter where you're, you're feeling you're undervalued in your current organization, wouldn't you, wouldn't that catch your eye, bro? Hey, I do that. And they're handing million dollar well, checks shit, out. Shit, man. You, you had me spun at two fights in one night. And, bro, and I swear to you. Really yeah, but if I that really so. is what they're doing, Fucking insane. And dude, no, I, it's going to be an ultimate fighter mo- moment for the PFL, I think. Yeah, damn right. Remember it how Because you know what? Fuck yeah, I remember what, what that did. And and it's going to be like the K1 Grand Prix. Remember those even? Straight up stand up? Oh. Shit. Right? Remember them shits where it was just like, oh my God. They had two people fighting in the parking lot. And the guy that won in the parking lot is now fighting because the two guys that he's replacing the one dude that, that gutted out of the three rounds. The six, I, I'm i telling you, tournament tournaments are where it's fucking at. I know MMA is tough to do that, but, like, you know, I think it's going to be one, uh, two of the rounds are going to be in one evening. I'm serious. Oh, my God, I can't wait. <laughs> somebody, somebody, I mean, I, I almost, now I got, we got a fact check just in case, but, like, I really, I saw that on the graphic, and unless somebody at, in the graphics department of the last PFL event, was specifically trying to just fuck with you and I. I think I think that's gonna be gonna be what happens. Um, you know, but even regardless, like say for you know, it doesn't. I think as as the bracket filters out and 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 kind of funnels towards the finals, the semis and the finals, I think they're gonna they're gonna push it a little bit more. And like I said, if if you did if you did your job or if I did my job and I turned on you know I flipped Twitter open. And they were given million dollar checks for exactly the same job that I did. Wouldn't that make you? I'd be like, wait a second. Where's the catch? I would say that might be because I'm a cynic. But I would also go, wait a second. I do that job. Tommy, you'd be like, wait a second. You know, I do that for a living. They're giving guys million dollar checks to do what I do. Hmm. Well, that's definitely going to be excited. That's definitely going to be exciting to look forward to. But th- there are plenty, plenty more uh, tournament fights heading up before we get to those playoffs and stuff like that. But buddy, we're going to wrap it up right here. This was a great show. Um, thank you again to Short Jose Shorty Torres for coming on, guys. He's going to be fighting August fourth 
at uh, UFC 227 against Alex Perez. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Guys, Rachel Blaze's campaign has been extended. You guys are buying the shirts. You're doing it. You're helping her out. Please keep buying those shirts. Yes. Head over to rachelblaze.com. Go over to gruntstyle.com. Buy the shirt for uh, breast cancer. Wow, breast cancer. Breast implant awareness. Um, There's plenty of women out there that are suffering the same way that Rachel's suffering from. It's a very, very expensive surgery to have those implants removed. And, I mean, they're they're literally destroying this poor woman's body. Um, So please get out there. Buy the shirt. Um, We don't have a guest lined up for next week, but we will always have some exciting MMA stuff to talk about. Omar, this was a great show, brother. Uh, Special thank you to our sponsors, ADK Fightwear, Black Hole Jiu-Jitsu, Madama Jiu-Jitsu, Two Minute Warning Sports 360, and our family over there at Fightbook MMA. I am your host, the Reverend Tommy D. We were joined by Kareem the Dream. He had to go take off and do his fatherly duties. El Profesor Omar Sangarima. We are Pride Rules Podcast. Good night.